Here's a simple definition of strategies. A strategy is a specific way of organizing. A strategy is nothing but a specific way of organizing your resources. Strategy is a specific way of organizing your resources. Now we know what it means to organize, right? In a specific way, it doesn't mean random. It means a very specific way of organizing your resources. What are your resources? Well, it depends on the strategy. If it's financial strategy, then your resources might be money, time, decision-making, the way you feel, because that's going to affect the way you use your money. How many follow that? Those will all be those. If we're talking about, uh, let's say, love strategies, what makes you feel loved is there's only five possible elements for that. The resources are what you think about, what you focus on, what you picture, what you say to yourself, how you breathe, how you move. Those are all resources. And if you use them in a specific way, you'll feel loved or unloved. How many follow that? Say, I. So a strategy is a specific way of organizing your resources in order, in order to consistently produce a specific result. I'll say that slowly. In order to consistently produce a specific result in order to consistently produce a specific result. Why do we want to consistently produce a specific result? Because the whole idea of a strategy is once you figure something out, you can do it as, much, as often as you want, every time, totally consistent, and it's a specific result you're after. So what's the strategy? A specific way of organizing your resources in order to consistently produce a specific result. So what's an example of a strategy? Well, as I already said, are there strategies for having too much month at the end of the money? Are there specific ways of organizing the way you spend money, the way you spend your time, the way you think about things, your emotion, your feeling, that will cause you to constantly have less money than you need, yes or no? Yes or no? How many have mastered these in your past? <laughs> Are there specific strategies for financial abundance? Ways of earning, ways of saving, way of spending, way of investing that will consistently cause you to have financial abundance, yes or no? Of course there are. What other kinds of strategies are there? You tell me. What other kinds of strategies are there? Yes, sir. Strategies for cooking. Are there specific ways of organizing various ingredients and the heat you put them in, how much time you spend with it, that'll cause you to consistently get the exact result you want in baking, for example, or cooking? Yes or no? What do we call those? What do we call those strategies? Recipes, okay. Somebody else, what's another kind of strategy? Yes. I can't hear you. Okay, strategies for managing your time. Are there specific ways of organizing what you focus on where you spend your time, how much time you spend on things in order to consistently feel like your life is being managed effectively, yes or no? Sure, are there strategies for becoming stressed? Are there strategies for depression? Is depression a strategy? Yes, it's hard to get depressed, you gotta work at it. You gotta organize the resource of your breathing and your shoulders and the muscles in your body and your face and what you picture and the tone of voice you use and what you say to yourself and what you imagine to feel depressed. It's a lot of work. Now, if you practice it a lot, you get good at it and do it at will. Okay, but it is a strategy. It's a, it doesn't happen unless you do things that way specifically. Is joy a strategy? Is there a strategy for feeling joyful or happy on a consistent basis, yes or no? How many found yesterday that if you organized your resources in a specific way, Meaning the way you were breathing, the way you were using your face, you could be joyful or increase your happiness. If you did it a different way, you'd be depressed or frustrated. How many of you did that yesterday? Say, I. So those are strategies. What other kind of strategies are there? Athletic strategies, peak performance strategies, ways of organizing, what you think about, the way you move your body, what you notice, what you anticipate when you're in a sport in order for you to consistently perform at your peak. Somebody else. Attraction strategies. Listen. When you get attracted to someone, it is a strategy. There are specific things that trigger you to feel attracted to someone or not feel attracted to someone. It's very specific. You may not be paying attention to it consciously, but it's there. And by the way, do you have strategies already for trying to cause people to feel more attracted to you already? Yes or no? Yes or no? Ways of organizing 
the ways in which you dress, the ways in which you speak, the way in which you look at someone, all those things, what you do, maybe where you touch them when it's appropriate, so that hopefully it increases some of that attraction, yes or no? Oh yes. So here's the truth. Any result you've ever produced in your life more than once, you have a strategy for. You have one problem though. Most of your strategies are unconscious. So you don't know how you do it. You have a strategy, but you don't know how you do it. So what you do is you hope that something in the environment will trigger it and it will happen. Now, four reasons to master strategies. Number one reason, when you master strategies, you can now consistently produce any result you've done in the past. So what it allows you to do is duplicate any result you've ever done in your entire life. So if you think of anything you've done that you really like, like maybe you felt really attracted or really creative or really motivated or really in love, I don't know what it is, but anytime you've really felt that, you can now fire off that creativity at will, fire off that feeling of love at will, fire off that decisiveness at will. So there is no question you know you can do that for the rest of your life. That's the first reason you want to master strategies, consistency. The second reason you want to master strategies is it can help you to help anyone else you know to consistently get a result. See, once you know how to do this for yourself, you can also do it for somebody else. So if you have a friend who, let's say Shelly here, you've seen her before like totally on fire, driven, excited to do something, and now she is absolutely depressed and bored, you can help her find out what she does when she's really driven, and you can trigger that strategy for her and show her how she can trigger it for herself for the rest of her life so she never has to go through that again. Third reason to master strategies is to manage someone else to manage someone else. See, if you work for me and I know your motivation strategy, instead of trying to motivate you the way I'd be motivated, which works for me and maybe not for you, I'll know what really motivates you and I can get you to want to do something, not have to do something. It's a big difference. Like for example, would you like to be able to get your kids to want to clean their room? You say, Tony, if you can explain that today, you are God, <laughs> okay? We're going to show you. you. The reason you're not getting through and getting motivated is you're trying to motivate them using your strategy. You're not doing it with their strategy. That's why it doesn't work. So once you understand strategies, you can elicit someone else's and use it to manage them effectively. And then the fourth reason to master strategies is because mastering strategies offers you really a way to model people. So if someone is outstanding, they're really, really good at something. Let's say Jason here can laugh, a drop a hat, and have fun. And you're serious as a heart attack. And you go, but I, I just don't think anything's funny. You could model Jason's strategy. You're getting himself in that plate where he la place where he laughs so easily, and you'll find yourself laughing. Or if, you know, John over here is unbelievably effective at making powerful decisions, and you can't make a decision what to have for dinner, you can model John's strategy and apply it, and all of a sudden you can make the same kind of quality of decisions. So strategies allow you to model as well. So number one, helps you get a consistent result. Two, help anybody else get a consistent result for themselves. Number three, chance to manage people effectively. Number four, chance to model. Would that be enough reasons to really apply yourself today, yes or no? What if I told you that I personally know John the Baker? John the Baker? Yeah, John has spent 25 years of his life to develop the ultimate chocolate cake. I know him personally. Now, the question I have for you is this. John has spent 25 years of his life to develop this ultimate chocolate cake. No one makes better, better chocolate cake in the world than John, the baker. The question is this. Can you and I, amateur bakers that we are, produce the same quality of chocolate cake as John the baker, even though we don't have 25 years of experience? Yes or no? Yes. yes. How? By what? Do that again. <laughs> How? That's right, by his recipe, which is also known as his, his strategy. So now you know what strategies are. Strategies are just like recipes. And since you know that metaphor, you already know most of there is to know about what a strategy is. Let's see, what does a recipe really do? It guarantees us that we can consistently produce a target state. Isn't that right? Like a specific quality of cake. Let's say that's the result. And so what it does is it tells us how to get that 
And what it does is it gives us a set of what to start with? What's the first thing it tells us? Ingredients. So it tells us what ingredients to use, what specific ones, how much, what order, et cetera, to get this result. How often can you get this result when you know the recipe? How often? Every time. So the, the result, the chocolate cake we're going to go after, the recipe of, for chocolate cake we're after is called motivation, let's say. We have to find out exactly what you do to consistently get motivated. And it is as consistent as a recipe for chocolate cake. Or what is your recipe for falling in love? Many of you fall in love, but you don't know what happens. Or you have people you want to fall in love with you and you don't know their strategy. And you really love them, but you're communicating in a way that doesn't meet their strategy so they don't feel it. So we want to be able to find out anyone's strategy, but first of all, our own to start with. So if John the Baker gave me his recipe, the first thing the recipe would tell me is what are the what? Ingredients. Now, are there unlimited like elements that could go into some form of baking? Yeah, virtually unlimited, right? So, so you don't become overwhelmed. Years ago, bakers, people in the food business, came up with a way to take all these zillions of items and kind of group together the ones that relate to each other so they could think of them in smaller terms. And what that's called is chunking, chunking things together. And they created what's called the five basic food groups. So even though there might be almost unlimited types of foods, they all fit in one of those five groups, right? So that helps you not become overwhelmed. So you know that whatever John's recipe is gonna give you, it's gonna come out of one or more of those five groups, right? Well, in human recipes, in human strategies, there's only five types of ingredients as well. Lots of individual ones, but only five big groups. And those are, there are visual ingredients. What other kind of ingredients are there? Auditory ingredients. What else? Kinesthetic ingredients, which is sensations, right? Emotions, feelings. Olfactory ingredients, which are what again? Smell. And gustatory, which is taste. So we know, for example, to get motivated, as an example, an emotional state called motivation is the result of cooking the right ingredients in the right amounts in the right order and sequence. How many follow this? Say I. Now, we could take these giant groups and make them a little bit more specific by saying there's two giant groups of visual ingredients. There are visual with a small e, which means visual external ingredients or their visual internal eye ingredients. So those are, we can subset these two, you follow me? So for example, if you were to look up now and see me standing here, as you look at my body or see my face or just see me standing in this place, you're having a visual external or internal experience, which one? External. If you close your eyes and picture me in your mind without looking outside, that's visual internal experience, okay? Similarly, you can have an auditory external experience or an auditory internal experience, in terms of ingredients. So if you're listening to me right now as I'm saying what I'm saying in this moment, you're having an auditory external experience. If you remember something I said yesterday or five minutes ago in your head and you hear it, that's an auditory internal experience. If you say something out loud to me, that's an example of auditory. If you say something in your head but don't speak it aloud, that's auditory. Internal. You can have a kinesthetic external experience, or you can have kinesthetic inter external or internal experiences, either one. Now, by the way, I pause on this one because a lot of people get confused when we start to do these. And let, let me give you a quick idea of what I'm talking about here. If I come along here and I walk up to somebody here and I walk up to this lady and I reach over and I touch her face like this, if she goes, oh, I hate that, or oh, that feels good. Those are emotional responses to a touch. Emotions are internal, right? They're deep inside of you. You may express them outside, but you experience them inside. If I reach over here and I touch her face like this, and she has no feeling about it, her, she, her brain just goes, oh, I was touched. You know, her skin, note, her muscles just note that there was a message. In that case, it's kinesthetic external because the musculature is on the outside. My moving towards her my physical movement towards her is an example of kinesthetic external. The feeling I'm having as I move towards her, good, bad, or indifferent, is kinesthetic. If I touch her like this and she slaps me, the slap would be kinesthetic. How I felt about it would be kinesthetic. Great, you got it. Same thing can be true for olfactory. You can have an olfactory external, olfactory internal, 
You can smell something right now, external, or you can remember the smell of grandma's apple pie. And the same thing is true with gustatory, external or internal. You can taste something right now, or you can remember the taste. By the way, I should tell you that if you overeat on a regular basis, one of the reasons you overeat is you're not actually tasting your food, you are tasting the memory of past food. You're having a gustatory internal experience. What happens is you get something, you've had a lot of good feeling from in the past, you go to eat, or you're stressed especially, you go to eat, and as soon as you see the food, it triggers the hypnosis and you go into the state of that. And so you keep eating because you actually aren't feeling what's going on now. You're not feeling and tasting the sensations of now, you're tasting the memories. And so since you're not connected to your body in the present, you keep eating to keep triggering the memory. So it's an interesting process. So oftentimes it's so easy to change someone's overeating pattern just by taking them out of gustatory internal and putting them in gustatory external, where now they actually become associated to what's really going on. So these are the five ingredients. We, most of us know these as the five senses, right? But there are two other words that are used for these. So when I use them, you'll know what they are and you won't be confused. They're also known as the five representational systems. That's a big word, but it just means that anything happens in the world, the only way you know what happens is these five senses represent to you what just happened, right? Visually, you get a representation. Or another word for that is representation. So a representation of what you just saw or heard or felt through your five senses. So if I said, what representational system is this person using right now? You might say they're in visual, right? A short for that is we might say rep system, which is just short for representational system. The other word that's used to describe these five senses or these five ingredients is the word modality. Modality or mode. So if I said, what modality is that person? And you might say they're using visual modalities right now or they're in a kinesthetic mode or modality, okay? So whether I say senses, ingredients, modalities, rep system, representational system, your brain will just nod and go, yep, I'm smart. I know what that hell that means, right? Modality just means one of the five senses, all right? Now, if John the Baker gave me his recipe and it gave me the ingredients, but that was it, it said, use some flour, right? Use some chocolate, use some milk, are you going to be able to make the same quality of chocolate cake as John the Baker, yes or no? No. So we need to know more than just the ingredients. What's the second thing we got to know? Tell me. That's right. We need to know the amounts and the qualities. What are going to be the amounts and qualities of each of these ingredients? Do we use six gallons or two teaspoons? Do we use, you know, normal milk or do we use low fat or do we use buttermilk? Right? We use the same ingredient, but a different quality of it is going to create a very different chocolate cake. A different amount of it, very different chocolate cake. Does that make sense? So if you and I are using, let's say, motivation as our strategy, and you said, Tony, I made a picture to get motivated, I need to know the amounts and qualities. Was it moving or was it still, as an example? Would that change how you feel about it? Yes or no? Yes or no? A little or a lot? Okay. So the word that we use to describe these more specific descriptions of a mode, right, where you describe, let's say, the picture with more detail, amounts and qualities, it's called sub-modality. These are called modalities, so these detailed descriptions are called sub-modalities. So a visual sub-modality might be, a way of measuring visual might be, let's say, for example, whether it's in color or black and white, whether it's moving or still, if you change those submodalities, will you get a different chocolate cake? You bet. So you tell me now, use your brain. What are some other examples of visual submodalities? Tell me. Okay, good. Is it close or is it far? Good. Is it bright or is it dim or dark? By the way, how many of you found when I had you make things closer, bigger, brighter, smaller, how many found that it immediately changed the chocolate cake you were baking in your body, i.e. how you felt at that moment? How many found that to be true? Say I. Okay. What other visual submodalities besides brightness, color, moving still, close, far? Okay, good. Size. If the image is really big, really small, what else? Is it focused or is it defocused? Makes a big difference. Okay. Someone said the speed of the movement. Is it moving slow or fast? How about the direction of the movement? Does that make any difference? 
What if you imagine watching a monster movie and the monster's coming at you like this? Does that feel different if the monster's going? Or if the monster's going? Does it feel different in your body? You bet it does, okay? So direction and speed of movement, close or far, moving is still. How about whether you're in the picture or watching? Does that change how you feel? Yeah, that's called whether you're associated or disassociated, in the picture or if you're watching it. What are some other visuals? Well, someone said feeling. Feeling is not that. You may see something and get a feeling, but that feeling is not a visual submodality. Well, another one is it two-dimensional or three-dimensional, right? Give me some examples of some auditory submodalities. Give me some auditory submodalities. Okay, volume, how loud it is. Tone, pitch, what else? Timbre, which is the quality of the sound. Tempo, the speed of the sound. Rhythm. Come on, what else? Okay. Harmony, if it sounds in harmony or cacophony. Clarity, or lack thereof. The number of sounds. Sequence of sounds, what else? Emphasis, which sounds are emphasized most. Okay, speed is tempo. How about location of a sound? Would that change how you feel about it? Oh yeah. If you heard a sound and that sound was boom, 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 and you heard that sound, it was off in the distance over there, would that feel different than if it was right behind your head? Or what if it was in your own chest? Right, you start going, aliens, right? right? All that process, location makes a difference. And sound has a direction very often. So if you hear an ambulance and you hear it like this, Say when you think it's approaching, it has a different effect than when you think it's leaving you, as an example. So let's experiment, shall we? Okay, we're going to play with the submodalities here. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine that totally sexy voice saying something to you that would definitely excite you. Definitely. Okay. What'd you say? <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Whatever voice works for you. <laughs> I want you to imagine definitely breaking my pattern. <clears throat> Actually, it's not sexy, it's called strained. <laughs> so I want you to imagine that voice that would totally turn you on. As you do, I want you to imagine it saying to you the thing that would totally excite you. If this person said this to you in this voice, you would feel juiced. Okay, think of what that voice would say to you. Just think of it. How it would say it to you, what the voice would say, if it really excited you. I mean really excited you. How many have got a clear idea of what that voice would say to you? Say, I. Outstanding. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine right now that you're going to hear this voice right here, coming from right here in front of you, saying that exact same thing, saying it to you, that totally sexy voice coming from in front of you. Go ahead and do that and just notice how that feels. If that feels good, say yes. Good. Now open your eyes. Let go of that state for a second. Some of you don't want to come back. <laughs> We're going to go right back to it. I just want to break the pattern for a second. It's okay. 
Now I want you to hear that voice saying that same sexy thing to you in that same voice, but I want you to hear it in your right ear this time. So this time I want you to hear it in your right ear, in your right ear. Notice how that feels. And if that feels good, say yes. That's right. Open your eyes. Let go of that feeling for a second. Okay, now this time I'm going to have you hear it, saying it to you in that totally sexy voice from behind you and see how that feels. Go ahead. And if that feels good, say yes. Oh, that one really works for a few of you, I see. <laughs> now, open your eyes. Close your eyes and have it come in your left ear, hearing that same sexy voice saying that same thing to you. And see, how does it feel in your left ear? If that feels good, say yes. Now open your eyes. How many found there was one location that definitely was superior to all the rest? Let me see your hands. Okay, good. Well, let's take a poll here. How many of you found it was from the front that did it, in the front? Okay. How many found in the right ear is what did it for you, in the right ear? Okay. How many found it was from behind you? How many thought it was coming from the left ear that did it? Left ear. Okay, good. <laughs> now, <laughs> so now, let's see if we can't apply this in a practical way. We say, what's the practical way? No, no, not this ear, stupid, this ear. <laughs> That's one application. That's an application that really will affect you. But here's another application. I want you to think of what you say to yourself. How many of you in this room ever really beat yourself up verbally? How many of you like, you know, rank on all of yourself, you know, just beat yourself up verbally? Okay, good. Well, I think you're really lousy at that, and I want you to get better at it. So, uh, I, mean, I don't believe in doing things good. I want you to be outstanding in beating yourself up verbally. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think for a second about what you say to yourself and the tone of voice you use when you're really angry at yourself and you're beating yourself up verbally. Think about what you say and how you say it in your head. How many of you can remember something you say? Raise your hand if you can remember it. Okay, say it out loud right now. Go ahead. Come on. Say it again. Come on. Say it again. And notice how that feels. Notice how it feels. Now, I want to tell you what you just did was pathetic. You people do not know how to beat yourself up properly. So I want to give you some instructions so you can become outstanding. So here's how you do it. I want you now to remember that totally sexy voice you had before. And I want you to remember the location that did it most for you, whatever that location was. And what I want you to do is I want to beat yourself up with that voice and that location. All right, go ahead and try it. Sexy voice, perfect location. Say what you say when you normally beat yourself up. Come on, say it. Say it. You people are enjoying this a little too much. If it feels good to beat yourself up now, say I. Outstanding. From now on, that's your new standard for verbal beat up. Give yourselves a hand. Nice job, ladies and gentlemen. So, as you can see, by making some subtle changes in tonality, tempo, and location, one can radically change how one feels about any auditory experience, especially even ones that are harsh in the words, okay? Give me some examples of kinesthetic submodalities now. Give me some examples of kinesthetic submodalities. How many realize this ain't algebra, baby, at this stage? Say I. <laughs> This is the secret to turning on any emotions you want at will. That's what this is. So tell me some examples of kinesthetic submodalities. Okay, temperature, hot or cold. Okay, hot or cold. What else? Okay, texture, smooth or rough. Someone just said pressure, tension. How else? Hot would be under temperature. Okay, 
Something rigid or flexible, something you feel rigid or flexible. Someone said location. Okay, okay anything changing size or shape you can feel. Okay. Violent or subdued would be of what though? Violent pressure, tension, you know what I mean? That's a, that's a modifier of something other than a submodality. So I got temperature, texture, pressure, tension, rigid or flexible, size or shape. Okay, throbbing. Moisture, good, moisture. Intensity is a measure of intensity what? You can intensify brightness, you can intensify pressure, you can intensify so many things. So, what's that? Breathing, good. Okay, moving or still. Heavy or light, which would be weight. Heavy or light. Someone said goosebumps. You have a strategy for goosebumps called chocolate cake. And for you to get goosebumps, certain things trigger you. And the things that trigger you is some combination of submodalities that come together to create goosebumps. Visual, auditory, and kinesthetic submodalities. And if we change your submodalities, goosebumps will disappear. Ever had goosebumps and them disappear in a second? What makes them disappear? You think they only last that long? No. The triggers are no longer being used. So then they stop. When you stop the triggers, you stop the result. Does that make sense? Good. Oh my God, it made sense. Give her a hand, ladies and gentlemen. That's an amazing thing. So we've got kinesthetic submodalities of weight, temperature, texture, pressure, tension, rigid or flexible, something changing size you can feel, or shape, throbbing, moisture, breathing, movement, location. How about another one? How about duration? Some things, right? Some things feel good for a short time, but not for a long time. Some things feel good for a long time, but not for a short time, right? So duration is also important. Now, some people say, well, what about pain? Isn't pain a submodality? No, pain is a chocolate cake, right? With tuna, <laughs> right? No, well, pain is a result. When you have pain, it's because of what you're focusing on. Have you ever cut yourself, for example, not felt any pain at all until you notice, well, oh my God, I'm cut, and then you got the pain? How many of you have that experience? Say I. It's because for your pain, you have to have a visual set of submodalities for you. Or have you ever been in major pain and then something caught your attention and you focused on that? And while you're focusing on that, you focused on a different set of submodalities and you had no pain during that time. How many experience that? Say I. So pain is a strategy. Now you may be not be setting it off consciously, but it's a strategy. And by the way, pain will happen automatically to signal to you something's wrong. But sometimes you know it's wrong and you correct it, but you keep feeling the pain. And the reason is because you keep running the strategy. Well, let's finish figuring out what it is we got to know to know strategies. If we go to John the Baker, he's got to tell us his ingredients and he's got to tell us the amounts and qualities. Is there anything else he's got to tell us? Yes or no? Yeah, he's got to tell us the order and sequence, right? Because even if you write ingredients, put them in the wrong order and sequence, you won't get the same quality of chocolate cake. Same thing's true with a telephone number. You know somebody's number dialed in the wrong order, you're not gonna reach them. You know the keys to a vault, the, the numbers to the vault, put them in the wrong order, it doesn't work. So you have a sequence for being motivated, for example. Some of you see something, and then you say something to yourself, and that gives you a feeling called motivated. Others of you say something to yourself, and then you get a feeling, and you say, I'm motivated, and you're motivated at that point. There are all kinds of sequencing. Do you follow me on this? And sometimes people use more than three. You know, they use those three and they recycle them to get motivated. So there is a sequence that's very important. And by the way, the order and sequence, we also call the syntax. It's like if I said the dog bit Johnny. You all know what that is, right? But what if I said Johnny bit the dog? Same exact ingredients, different sequence, very different experience, especially if you're Johnny, right? So sequence is called syntax also. For short, we say order and sequence is the syntax. So you gotta know the ingredients, the amounts and qualities, and the syntax, the order and sequence that need to go into. And then the fourth thing is, you gotta be able to know how John cooked it. Meaning you can have the same ingredients, right? Same order and sequence of those ingredients, same amounts and qualities. But if you cook yours, he cooks his at 700 degrees, 675. 
and you cook yours at 50 degrees, are you going to get the same result? Obviously not. Well, what does that have to do with a human being strategy? Well, if you make the same picture, like watch this. Let's say I told you the way I motivate myself is to make a big, bright picture that's very close. And then I say to myself, let's do it in a certain tone of voice. And then I get this feeling that motivates me. But this is how you do it. You do, you do the right ingredients, the right tonality, right everything, but you do it in this physiology, because the physiology is your oven. The way you use your physiology cooks it. So if I say make a bright picture, and you make a bright picture like this, is that gonna produce the same kind of bright picture as if you do it like this? Yes or no? No, this is cooking at 675, this is cooking at 50. You follow me on this? So there are four elements to strategies. You gotta know the ingredients. What did they actually do? You gotta know, secondly, the amounts and qualities. Like, did they make a picture? Did they bring it close, far, big? Did they say, I hate this, I love this? Did they say it fast? They go, I love this. They say it slow, I love this. How do they do it, right? And then, most importantly, what's the sequence of it? What did they do first, second, third? And then lastly, what was their physiology like when they were doing it and for how long? They didn't cook it for 50 you know, years. They cooked it for a certain period of time with a certain intensity. Okay? How many follow this? Say aye. aye. 